Chain of the days and nights, fashioner of every event. Chain of the days and nights, fountain of life and of death. Chain of the days and nights, two-colored thread of silk, woven by him that is into his being's robe. Chain of the days and nights, sigh of eternity's music, where he of all possibility sounds the height and the depth. This is how Iqbal, the poet philosopher of Islam, interpreted the entity of time. There was a time when the dynamic message of Islam spread from the shores of the Atlantic to the borders of China. For about a millennium, Muslims were the dominant power in the old world. They freed humanity from the shackles of slavery and exploitation. They revived the Greek philosophy, opened new avenues of knowledge, and ignited the torch of learning in the utter darkness of the Middle Ages. They founded a civilization which created many splendors. The immortal message of Islam shook the mighty Himalayas and the South Asian subcontinent saw its golden age under the Mughals. The world was aglow with the blessings of Islam. The times changed and the Muslim power began to wane. In South Asia, two of its last defenders fell in 1757. One of them was the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Dola, and the other was the ruler of Mysore, Tipu Sultan, whose love for freedom has now become a legend. In 1857, Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar, a mere symbol of Mughal power, was deposed and banished to Rangoon. The great Mughal Empire came to an end. The Age of Enlightenment in the West had brought darkness to the East. The rising European powers subjugated and colonized the rich countries of Africa and Asia. They were growing under their tutelage. South Asia was being crushed under the white man's burden when a man was born who was to become immortal as an apostle of freedom and as a poet whose exquisite verse is a clarion call to action. In 1877, in the city of Sialkot, was born Muhammad Iqbal, the poet of the East, the awakener of his people, and the creator of the concept of Pakistan. His father, Sheikh Noor Muhammad, and mother, Imam Bibi, were pious and God-fearing. During his early education, his extraordinary talents caught the attention of a savant of oriental learning, Shamsul Ulema Mir Hassan, who was a great friend of his father. He did his matriculation from the Scotch Mission High School and cleared his intermediate examination from the Murray College, Sialkot. Lahore, the provincial capital of Punjab, was a great educational center. Students from all over the province came to the city for higher education. Iqbal also shifted to Lahore and took lodgings in the Bazare Hakima, the street of scholars. For centuries, Lahore has been a great center of Islamic culture and civilization. It was in this city that Iqbal bloomed as a poet and saw the dream of an Islamic renaissance. The superb artistry of Lahore's historical monuments bear witness to the achievements of the Islamic civilization in this part of the world. 
Iqbal took admission in the Government College Lahore, from where he graduated in 1897, and a couple of years later received his master's degree in philosophy from the Punjab University. In 1899, he was appointed a reader in the Oriental College and in 1902 joined the Government College as an additional professor. Recognition came to him early as a poet of great consequence. Recital of his poems was a regular feature of the annual sessions of the Anjuman e Himayat e Islam, a socio educational organization for the uplift of the Muslims. As advised by Sir Thomas Arnold, whose pupil he had been, Iqbal sailed for England in 1905 for higher studies. When his ship approached Aden, the sight of the holy land of Arabia stirred his emotions. This was the land treaded upon by the Holy Prophet, the last messenger of the Almighty, who had proclaimed the unity and sovereignty of God and gave mankind a code of life, which is a panacea for all the ills of humanity. Islam envisages a human society free from all kinds of exploitation. It gives equal rights to every man for his spiritual and material development, irrespective of caste, color, creed or language. The sight of the Holy Land reminded Iqbal that the Muslims had shunned superstition and ignorance and extolled knowledge. They were instrumental in bringing about the Renaissance in Europe and were in fact the progenitors of all advancement made by mankind today. But they were themselves lying low in a state of intellectual stupor since the Middle Ages. Up till now, Iqbal's poetry was a reaction to external stimuli such as nature, eroticism, nationalism, etc. Now, he was to become a judge of his environment, a creator of values, an interpreter of the humane ideals of Islam. Iqbal reached London on 24th September, 1905. London, at that time, epitomized the achievements of the Western civilization. The lamps of knowledge blazed in its precincts. Iqbal took admission in the Trinity College, Cambridge, where he found in Professor McTaggart a great teacher of philosophy who influenced him considerably. He was awarded a degree in philosophy from Cambridge and was called to the bar from the Lincoln's Inn. In England, he made friends with such renowned Orientalists as Professors E.G. Brown, Nicholson and Sawley. The house in which Iqbal lived in London bears a memorial plaque. In the meantime, Iqbal went to Heidelberg, where he learned the German language and collected reference material for his thesis. His lodgings in Heidelberg bear a memorial plaque. And this is the road which has been named after him. The University of Munich awarded him a doctorate for his thesis on the development of metaphysical thought in Persia. A memorial to Iqbal adorns the city of Munich. In November 1907, Iqbal returned to London and for six months, in the absence of Professor Arnold, taught Arabic in the London University. During his three years stay in Europe, Iqbal drank deep at the fountainheads of Western philosophy and culture. He approached modern knowledge with a respectful but independent attitude. The dazzling exterior of Western civilization could not hide from him its inherent contradictions and duplicity. Steeped in gross materialism, this civilization denied all spiritual values. It preached man's equality and sucked men's blood.
Iqbal was strengthened in his conviction that it was only the true spirit of Islam, fortified by modern knowledge, which could solve the problems confronting mankind. In September 1908, Iqbal returned from Europe and started legal practice in Lahore. He also got a job as part-time professor of philosophy in the government college, but soon resigned, for government service deprived him of expressing his ideas freely. About that time, the plight of the Muslims was reaching its lowest ebb. Iqbal saw the ascending power of Western imperialism and the onslaughts it was making against the Muslim world. The Western powers were bent upon exterminating the last of the great Muslim powers, the Ottoman Empire. Italy's attack on Tripoli had enraged the Muslims everywhere. of the Muslims in South Asia were beating in unison with their brethren in the war-torn countries. Iqbal wrote extremely poignant poems. Before a large gathering in the Bad Shahi Mosque, Lahore, he recited a stirring poem which bears the caption, In the Presence of the Prophet. There is no quiet, master, in that land of time and space, and that existence we pursue forever hides its face. But I have brought this chalice here to make my sacrifice. It holds a thing not to be found within all paradise. See here, O Lord, the honor of your people bringing up. The martyred blood of Tripoli, O Lord, is in this cup. The First World War brought the Muslim world to its lowest ebb. Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Transjordan, all became mandatory territories of the Western powers. Egypt was throttled. The Ottoman Empire, once the greatest power on earth, had disintegrated and was vanquished. Iqbal was fully aware of the plight of Asia and clearly foresaw the dangers lurking ahead for the world of Islam. Now Asia's ancient begging cloak is torn to shreds. The young put on new glutted states, rich finery, the fires that Nimrod lit for Abraham now glare. Once more, a new tyrant frowns, a new ordeal prepares. As if it was not enough, a new problem raised its ugly head. Western powers were leaving no stone unturned for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. Muslims throughout the world were alarmed. Iqbal wrote in a letter, Presently, the Palestinian problem is foremost in the minds of the Muslims. Personally, I am ready to court arrest on this issue, for it may affect both Islam and South Asia. Iqbal's poetic fervor knew no bounds. He wrote poem after poem to arouse the suffering humanity. In his famous poem, Khizr, the Guide, he wrote elaborately on problems of capital and labor. Iqbal's poetry is a call to action. Of life, he said, 
but ask its inmost truth of that mountain hewer's soul, his stream of milk, his sharp axe, his bitter rock, his life. The Muslim world was in turmoil. The Turks, who were in fact the custodians of all that represented the glory of the Muslims, were facing unsurmountable odds. Western powers had nicknamed Turkey as the sick man of Europe. Arousing through verses of exquisite beauty, the disintegrated and the dormant world of Islam. Iqbal gave a dynamic interpretation of the eternal message of Islam and urged the Muslims to unite and meet the challenges of time. Iqbal's great love of liberty for all people and his urge for the emancipation of all mankind drove him out of the folds of narrow nationalism. He totally rejected the Western cult of nationalism, which was the creed of the Indian National Congress. He claimed that Islam was the basis of nationhood for the Muslims of India. <laughs> बाजू तेरा तौहीद की कुव्वत से कवी है इस्लाम तेरा देश है तू मुस्तफवी है नज़ारे देरी न जमाने को दिखा दे अय मुस्तफवी खाक में इस बुत को मिला दे Iqbal's poetic appeal was like a gushing stream. He ruled out all forms of national chauvinism, imperialist domination, racial discrimination, social and economic exploitation, and personal aggrandizement, since all of them debase human personality. He urged the people to fortify the ego so that the due respect and dignity of man is irrevocably restored. <laughs> देख ले साकिये लालफाम सुनाती है ये जिंदगी का प्याम। The falcon occupies an important place in Iqbal's poetic symbols. He exhorts the Muslim youth, in whose courage and ability he has tremendous faith, to emulate the life pattern of the falcon, who does not make a habitat and flies high into the vast spaces of the sky. Himself a profound philosopher, Iqbal's approach to philosophy was analytical and critical. Amongst the modern philosophers, he spoke of Karl Marx as a prophet uninspired by Gabriel. <laughs> He criticized Hegel for his shallow idealism. He said that Bergson's thought weakened man's ego. His poem, Lenin in the Presence of God, is an indictment against the West's worship of gold. Nietzsche, according to him, possessed a believer's heart and a heathen's brain.
Iqbal wrote poetry in both Urdu and Persian languages. He was a devotee of the great Persian mystic poet Rumi, whose verse, in his view, was in consonance with the teachings of the Holy Quran. The tomb of Rumi in the city of Konya is a shrine which attracts Sufi pilgrims from all over the world. And it was Rumi in whose company Iqbal embarked upon a celestial journey, a supreme achievement of his poetic imagination and intellectual powers. Iqbal's Javed Nama, the Book of Eternity, is a long dramatic poem in Persian which narrates the poet's spiritual journey to the heavens with Rumi as his guide. By means of various monologues and dialogues written in chaste verses of unparalleled charm and beauty, Iqbal expressed his thoughts on various problems that confront man and described the world order which he thought best for mankind. Iqbal rejected all forms of oppressive systems, imperialism, fascism, communism, and the capitalistic orders of life. As for communism and capitalism, he likened them to two millstones grinding man in between like glass. Iqbal laid great emphasis on Islamic social justice. The League of Nations was to Iqbal a farce. Why not a League of Mankind? The Western cult of nationalism had sown the seeds of discord amongst various people. It gave rise to chauvinism and engendered race and color prejudices. As enjoined by Islam, Iqbal treated mankind as one family. He believed in the unity of humanity based on equal rights for every human being. <laughs> فقط ملت آدم مکے نے دیا خاک جنیوا کو یہ پیغام جمعیت اقوام کہ جمعیت آدم In his later years, Iqbal yearned for a comrade who could lead the Muslims of the South Asian subcontinent to their destiny as visualized by him. قدیمِ من کجاست نخل سین آیم کلیمِ من کجاست that comrade and leader of men emerged in the person of Qaid Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Iqbal's message was universal and dynamic. His first addressees were the Muslims because Muslim society germinated the seeds of internationalism. Such a society fully developed in accordance with the revivified tenets and values of Islam and fortified by the achievements of modern knowledge could become a nucleus for the ultimate unity of mankind. This idea was foremost in Iqbal's mind when presiding over the Allahabad session of the Muslim League in 1930, he demanded a separate homeland for the Muslims of India. In 1931, Iqbal attended the second and third sessions of the Roundtable Conference, which was called in London by the British government for considering the question of constitutional reforms in the subcontinent. Spain, where the Muslim civilization flourished for 700 years and became instrumental in initiating the Age of Enlightenment in Europe. On his way back home, Iqbal visited Spain. The Mosque of Cordova inspired him to write one of his greatest poems. (laughs) 
After the fall of the Muslim power in Spain, Iqbal was the first Muslim to offer prayers in this mosque. Hai tahe gardun agar husn mein teri nazir, qalb musalma mein hai, aur nahi hai kahi. On the banks of the Guadalquivir, Iqbal's prophetic vision saw the revival of the glory of Islam. In 1938, Iqbal's failing health took a serious turn, and on 21st April of the same year, he breathed his last. Mankind lost one of her greatest sons. Iqbal had realized creatively that poetry and life are inseparable. With the establishment of Pakistan, his dream of a separate homeland for the Indian Muslims was realized. The resurgent spirit of Islam welcomed the birth of Pakistan in the same way as in one of Iqbal's finest poems, the earth soul welcomed Adam. Open thine eye. Behold the earth, the stars, and the atmosphere. Behold the sun rising from the east. These vapors and clouds, these winds and mountains, these deserts and oceans, the high vault of the heavens, and the silence of space are all thine to control. Till yesterday, the graceful forms of the angels pleased thine eyes. Behold today thine own form in the looking glass of time. Oh, no.